I would like to welcome everyone to the Q, uh, the Q and A discussion session for the wildfires global to local uh, seminar that is was part of the uh, 2022 annual meeting. And to thank you all for participating in a in a new format for us, where 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 we have a, a recording and then uh, a sort of do uh, you know a, a Q and A that 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 happens afterwards? So thank you for allowing us to try out a new format here. Um, if you can put your questions into the uh, Q and A, which which you can see at, at the bottom of your screen, I am going to go ahead and um, you know activate each of your audio so you'll be able to sort of answer, uh, ask any follow-up questions, but I think it will help us if you start by putting um, your initial, uh, initial questions in into the uh, uh, Q&A button at, at the bottom of your screen. And I'm very happy to introduce the uh, co-chairs of this program, um, Sari and, and Leanne, and they will have the, the, the speakers introduce themselves. And I'll let you go ahead and uh, Take it away. Thank you, Ruth. Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the question and answer session following our recorded session on wildfire prevention and response. The session has been organized by the Emergency Committee of the American Institute for Conservation, which produces and distributes educational resources around issues of emergency response, pre prevention, and salvage for the AIC community. I'm Saira Hukki and I use she, they pronouns and I've been a member of the emergency committee for the last three years, I think. I received my bachelor's degree from Carleton College and my master's degrees in art conservation and art history from New York University. I recently joined the National Archives after spending five years as book and paper conservator at the Minnesota Historical Society. Everyone, I'm Leanne, we're very excited to have this session with you all. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm also a member of the AIC Emergency Committee. Um, I'm currently the paper conservator at the University of Hawaii at Manoa Library. Sarah. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that those of us who are joining the session from North America are on the homeland of Indigenous people who have cherished and stewarded this land since time immemorial. I'm currently joining you from the homeland of the Nacotchtank and Piscataway nations, while Leanne is on the homeland of the Kanaka Maoli people. Our current lives are made possible because of the colonial mindset that allowed the seizure of these lands from their indigenous owners and the enslavement of African people to labor on it. I encourage you to learn more about the history of the land and the people who have cared for and worked on it. So since this is a question and answer session, please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box um, so we can get started. And unfortunately, I want to mention that Marianne, um, Kateri, and Camila were unable to join us today. Um, and Sonia will only be with us for about half the sessions. So if you have any questions for her and Kim, um, it would be great if you put those in sooner than rather than later. Um, and then let's have the panelists give a quick introduction to who they are. Um, maybe we can start with Vicki. Hi, I'm Vicki Lee, and I'm currently the supervisory conservator at the National Archives in St. Louis, the National Personnel Records Center. Um, I've been doing disaster work for about uh, 12 years now. That's it, thank you. Laura Buckner. Hi, my name's Laura Buckner. I'm an architecture conservator with Building Conservation Associates in New York City. Kim? Hi, I'm Kim Hoffman. I am the preservation librarian at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Cindy? Hi, I am a preservation technician at the National Archives at St. Louis, and I work with Vicki Lee on the burn files that we have in our collection. Josiah? I'm Josiah Wagner. Um, I'm a private practice objects conservator 
before getting into conservation, I was a full-time forestry firefighter for various government agencies all over the Western US. And these days I'm an occasional forestry firefighter with the Pennsylvania Department of Forestry. All right. Who's calling me? My name is Jared Yex. I'm the curator of collections for the Tri-Cities Historical Museum in Grand Haven, Michigan. And then I'm also a firefighter medic for the city of Walker. I'm the lieutenant for station three. And I'm a certified heritage emergency first responder. And Sonia? I'm Sonia Barron. Uh, like several other people on this panel, I work at the National Archives. And um, I'm on the... Um, Continuing operations uh, team for NARA, um, as is Vicki also. Um, I just started this job about a year ago. And uh, before that, I've worked at the um, Iowa State University Library and the Huntington Library as a book and paper conservator. Nice to be here. So if anyone has a question to start with, um, feel free to put it in the Q&A or uh, raise your hand. And in the meantime, um, I have a question um, actually for Vicky and Cindy. Uh, you talked about how the records you are dealing with were sort of treated en masse with time all. Do you have to take any precautions um, when you're treating these documents? We haven't specifically done anything in relation to the thymol itself. We do wear an N95 mask and we have fume hoods that are available to us. Since COVID, we've been using more of a, what we call a capper, which is kind of a helmet type system. It requires less um, disposable things that we use. Um, Vicki, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Um, just. Uh, we always have the option to wear gloves if we want to yeah. as well when we're working with those materials. Um, some people do and some people don't. We just we make sure that we have the PPE available for for people. But um, I don't know that we've done any testing in our uh, DC office for those materials uh, to see if there's any what residuals are left. Thank you. And I have a question for um, Jared. Um, you gave a really good description of like how a fire grows within a building. And one of the things you mentioned was that like a hollow corridor can give you like 15 minutes of buffer. And I was just wondering then, um, should we be using like metal doors for collection storage areas or um, are there other, you know, collection storage materials that, that are more, flame retardant or something that you know folks should be using in their collections? Yeah, the most important thing about that is just compartmentalizing your collection as much as possible to prevent fire spread from going throughout the building. Those hollow core doors you know, will eventually burn through. The, the solid core doors or when you start to get into the metal doors, those will last a lot longer. So if you do have someone who can respond to the fire, um, once, once it turns from a, uh, a wildfire into like a structure fire there, um, by having those those stronger reinforced doors and making sure that you've got the proper amount of drywall between rooms, um, that compartmentalization could save portions of your collection that where if it was just all open storage with no compartmentalization, you'd lose your whole collection. So, so by by having those those heavier doors that will buy you a lot more time uh, for the firefighters to be able to get in there and extinguish whatever's going on and potentially save the rest of your collection. Thanks, Jared. Um, our next question is for uh, Sonia and Kim. Um, if someone's at a very small institution with like a tight 
budget for collections emergencies and, you know, maybe like just a handful of staff and volunteers who can um, respond if a collections emergency occurs. How does someone navigate all of the resources that are available on the um, emergency response wiki? And like, which ones would you recommend for that kind of situation? Um, I'll take a, a stab at it um, first. Um, I would say that the first thing would be to maybe look at the all-inclusive resources um, on the Zotero uh, in the, in the Zotero library, and um, look at the overview of all the aspects that are involved in being prepared uh, for an emergency. So maybe the uh, National Park Service Museum Handbook, Chapter 10, which is a part of those inclusive, in, uh, all-inclusive resources. And there's also the uh, National Trust UK um, or Collections Trust, National Collection Trust, uh, UK uh, website in in Zotero in that first folder. Um, they sort of provide the framework of all the different aspects of preparedness and response. And I think that even for a small institution where you don't have actual staff members assigned to different functions, um, you could always scale down uh, kind of the template for your emergency plan to just the essential functions of what people need to do. Um, have, have a plan for if you have a leak, you know, who will you call? Are those phone numbers available? Uh, to people, where is your plastic? How will you dry your papers or books? It really doesn't have to be a big operation. Um, I think that the most important thing is to know, you know, know what is in your collection, and if an emergency happened, like a fire or a leak or flooding, um, what would get the most damaged and uh, which items will you get out first? Once you get them out, uh, how, what, what is the way to dry them? You know, will you know how to do that fairly quickly before they start getting together or moldy? Um, what is your cleanup plan? Um, emergency, I feel like from doing emergency response, even though there's a lot of resources in the folder in the Zotero library, uh, it's a very hands-on situation. So it's a, it's a very down-to-earth Situation where you, when you're in an emergency and you have to salvage your collections and teamwork with your, you know, with, with the people who are on your team. Um, and if you have a simple plan and uh, maybe a couple of, do a couple of exercises with your small team, I think that that will put you way ahead of the game um, as opposed to like if you just didn't have anything prepared or had an idea, just having that stuff in your mind um, and then putting it down on paper, I think it goes a really long way. That would be my, my two cents. I'm going to mute myself now. Kim, did you have anything to add? Um, not really. I guess 
Well, I guess thinking about it, um, the only other thing I would suggest, if you have a very limited number of staff and a limited amount of time, but you still want to take advantage of these resources, uh, we're hoping that that's one of the really nice things about using the Zotero platform is that we have these this added functionality over and beyond what the wiki can offer. So take advantage of the tags and take advantage of the other ways that Zotero lets you kind of slice and dice those views and maybe look for either institutions that resonate with your own institution's collection, um, uh, type of collection and maybe size um, or else your primary concerns and that help that, uh, let that help you narrow down the results that you're seeing so that you're not just seeing, you know, everything. So I, for example, I work at a library and I might first look at what the Library of Congress has to say if we have some resources from them or if your primary concern is wildfires, um, there are tags that can let you filter the Zotero view just to see the wildfire related information. Um, hopefully that'll help prevent some overwhelm in a limited uh, time crunch situation. Thank you. Um, our next question is for um, Josiah. Um, what are some factors to consider when hiring um, a landscaping contractor or designer to do like fire safe landscaping? Uh, so that's a, a very difficult question. Um, to the best of my knowledge, there are not currently any certifications for fire safe landscapers. So basically you have to find someone who says that they have experience in that and uh, or, well, someone who can demonstrate some degree of experience in fire safe landscaping. And you know, it, it's hard to know, it, it's kind of the wild west in the a sense of, you know, people can claim to have a, any number of, of experience. There's, there are good resources out there with uh, guidelines on fire safe landscaping, but there aren't specific training programs for landscapers, like, not that I'm aware of at any rate. Um, my understanding is that the uh, state of California has talked about putting together a certification program for fire safe landscaping, but uh, it's not actually implemented at this time to the best of my knowledge. So yeah, it's really tough. There are, you can find some uh, state forest services or state you know, departments of natural resources. It varies from state to state, but some of them will have lists of contractors who they use for their programs. Um, state parks or possibly national park service may also have some lists of uh, landscaping contractors who they have approved for work at, on their facilities. Uh, they, may be, they may share that information that would probably be the best bet for finding such people. But otherwise, I mean, theoretically anyone can claim to be a fire safe landscaping contractor. Uh, you have to kind of use your own judgment. There is, there's a program called Firewise or Firewise Communities. Uh, it's a program that was put together by the, um, National Fire Safety Administration, uh, the Park Service, Forest Service, and I think the uh, Association of State Forest Services, which it, it's an excellent resource, has a lot of good information. That program is it's really designed to facilitate communities all working together to fire safe their, their communities, but it has a lot of great information for individual homeowners as well. Um, and it, it's, it, it's a fairly formalized program. Uh, there, actually come to think of, there may be some provision for approving landscapers through that program. I don't really know the extent of it, but it, it's, it's really a program designed about around organizing communities to, to fire safe for their entire community. Again, that's a firewise or um, Firewise USA, something like that. It's the you, you can find uh, several websites devoted to that program. Thanks, 
Thanks, Desire. Kim, it looked like you had a question. I do. I have a question for Jared. Uh, for historic structures, is horsehair plaster and lath more or less protective during a fire than if you have drywall of the appropriate thickness? So that's that's kind of a tricky question because it's all going to depend on how thick is that plaster. So um, with drywall, you generally have a very uniform thickness for the drywall. With half inch, you've got about a, a half an hour rating for half inch drywall. And then five eighths inch jumps up to an hour of protection before you know that the fire will burn through. With the plaster, since it's it's just kind of put on to the lathe there, and th there's no real uniform way to say, oh yeah, that's definitely going to last longer or it's going to last shorter because of the amount that they put on to the lathe. Um, I know once it breaks through that lathe, it starts to crack it and, and break it apart and gets in or gets through the plaster and gets into the lathe. You now have a greater fire load inside of the wall, which will you know, give gives the fire more fuel, of course. Then so. Um, the plaster and lathe could buy you more time, but then also you got to consider that extra load. So um, it, it all really kind of depends from building to building. It's probably going to wildly vary um, just, just due to the, the ununiform uh, method of putting that plaster on. So, Gotcha. Thank you. I'm just checking to see if anyone has any other questions in terms of raising hands. All right. Um, my next question is for Laura. Um, how has your experience um, affected your approach to sample collection? Or do most labs prefer to um, conduct their own sample collection? Um, as far as sample collection, Actually, what happened is that we were we were forced to do the sample collection for the analysis um, after the fire. That the one that uh, really became the definitive answers for us. It actually occurred during COVID, which made it tricky because um, had to go into the space of the Oregon, which is a tight space, and people couldn't be in it. And those were early days of COVID, um, so it was actually done by just a couple people and. The rest of us watched on video screen. So the lab itself couldn't come to the site. Um, it was uh, the conservator that had been hired by the insurance company did the collection with us watching the lab, watching everybody looking at that collection. So that's, that was an interesting aspect of this collection. Um, but certainly um, relying on that ASTM standard and the importance of having the correct collection method, not just the test method, was really emphasized in what we did um, because it kind of came from different directions and it was just because everything in the particulars were so fine that it really required just the right method. So um, it, it is something to really consider in addition to the type of analysis. But that was also something to consider is if, if everybody can't be there, then we now have technology for people to sort of being looking in standard and, and making sure that if the lab can't come because they're across the country, like you want someone to do it, but they, it's expensive for them to come that now there are some options potentially. Yeah, that was really interesting that like the the collection method made such a real dramatic difference to the the test results. Um, let me see. Our next question is for Kim and Sonia again. Um, is there a way to find fire related resources in Zotero? Yes, uh, there is. Sonia, I can, can take this one. Um, so if you are looking in Zotero, uh, one of the easier ways to do that is there is a uh, tag cloud below the left hand pane, and that will filter the view to show you whatever is related to the, the tag you've picked. And I'm looking at it now, and I know that we have um, okay, so we have a tag that's fire, soot, and smoke. So that would probably be the one to go with. And then you click that and it filters the view. And there's now just a handful of materials and those have all been selected by that tag. Um, another way of 
doing that is to actually look through the folders. Um, so there is a, a file structure that's visible on that left-hand pane as well. And you can sort of look through and see um, whether there is a, something that it's related to fire um, and the aspect of fire that you're interested in in that folder um, structure. So for example, um, yeah. oh. Sorry, I was saying, could you share your screen when you're clicking through the the um when you're clicking through the tags and stuff? Do you mind sharing your screen? Were you looking at your Zotero screen when you were describing it? I can try. Let's see what happens. I think we're supposed to be able to do that. How's that? Can you see it? Um, yeah, I think I can. Great. Okay, so this is the tag cloud, if you can see down on the left hand side below, and I've clicked that, well now I just unclicked the fire set and smoke tag. Um, we'll click that again and you can see that now that's really a narrow view. And then I don't think that we have a specific fire folder exactly, but depending on what you're interested in, we have a folder on preparedness, we have a folder on mitigation. So that's another way of thinking about um, the resources that you're looking for that might be um, helpful. Uh, if you want to see whether we have anything about fire and risk assessment, you can click on that risk assessment folder um, and then click on that tag. And now you can see we had one result that was in the risk assessment folder and also has the fire set and smoke tag. So I hope that answers the question. Anything else that I should be showing off in Zotero while I've got it open related to that? I think that covers it there. Um, I was, I, I maybe not particularly about the fire question, but um, I will say that a lot of the resources will be applicable to fire emergencies uh, also because um, you know fire emergencies do often involve water and then it becomes a fire and water emergency and then um, the the salvage and recovery of collections does become kind of similar at that point um, so I think that when looking through the resources and kind of trying to break down the topic of the emergency into these um, into these uh, facets that you saw him show in, in Zotero uh, from beginning to end of the disaster or emergency cycle, um, you could look at pretty much any resource that is in there and then apply that information to your specific situation. Um, no emergency is, you know, too small if you have to salvage your, you know, salvage your collections, um, no matter you know, how many items you have to uh, to work with, you are going to be doing really similar actions. And um, the overall framework uh, can really be scaled down to the smallest organization, historical society. Um, yeah. Uh, that's all I can think of. I don't know what else to show off in Zotero. How, I guess just how easy it is to use. I feel like it's uh, shockingly easy. Great. Um, I'd just like to note that we've been joined by Camilla Corbella, who was another one of our um, presenters who 
we weren't sure if she was going to be able to make it, but she's been able to make it after all. Camila, do you want to do a quick um, introduction? Uh, yeah, hi. My name is Camila, and I'm a paintings and sculpture conservator from Germany. My company is called LA Art Labs, and it's based in Los Angeles. And we do big insurance claims on a regular basis. Right now, for instance, we're running through 500 artworks after disaster. Um, and that's what we've been focusing for like last one and a half weeks. So that's pretty intense. Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, the next question is for Vicki and Cindy. Or oh, wondering, I mean, you, you mentioned that there are like millions of records damaged in the 1973 fire and um, just wondering how many have been like what percentage of the records have been treated so far and just wondering how, how are the, if you still have damaged materials, how are they being stored prior to receiving treatment. You want to talk about the the percentage, Cindy, or do you want me to? Talk? Oh, I I'm not sure on the exact percentage because it changes, but I know about three years ago, one of my colleagues did a, a um, informal study of how much we have completed versus how much we have to do, and they said that the rate we were going, it would be about 500 years. So we figured our job security is spot on. <laughs> Um, Vicki probably has better numbers than that, but that was just shocking to me, <laughs> you know, and we've changed our, our process since then. Um, we store all of the burned records in uh, what we call um, the burn bays or the B file, the B files are stored in the burn bays, and they're at, I think, 55 degrees. Yes. Temperature is where they're supposed to kind of stay. There's a threshold up and down, obviously. We've been getting a little softer on some of that, but it's like kind of like a meat locker in there. But it's doing a really good job of stabilizing those records and allowing us to work on them slowly, kind of as um, they're needed. And we have such a volume of requests for materials that we literally work on things as they're needed to fill a request. Right, our, our files um, that were mostly damaged um, were probably from the early 70s, of course, from 73, what we had in store back through World War II primarily. We didn't have much uh, before that, but we're, um, yeah, we keep them, as Cindy said, cool and dry as we can and then uh, we'll get a request from a veteran asking for something out of the records or sometimes from their family. Um, and then we will look at that record and treat it if we need to. Uh, we do more triage sort of treatments now. When we do treat a record uh, fully and clean it and do whatever mends and things that need to be done, it's then turned into an S file. And those don't go back out into that burn bay they are shelved with the regular burned records. Or, I'm sorry, with just the regular records uh, out in one of the other bays at a, at a more, I don't know, regular temperature, which is you know, generally around uh, between 65 and 70 usually in our archival bays. Um, so it doesn't have to go back into that burned um, area again. Anything else, Cindy? I think you covered it. That was pretty good. I think we've got completely treated about 3% of the total that we have to do. It's a huge amount. And we have shifted. And this is, this is kind of, COVID is kind of a new pivoting point for us. You know, there was the 20 years after the fire, then the 20 years of our preservation program. And now looking forward, we're at a new pivoting point. Whereas we're moving more from doing the physical treatment to records as to doing more digital um, response to records. It allows us to do more with less resources. And we're still able to safeguard the records. They're just not fully treated in the physical sense, if that makes any sense. Right, and those records do go back into the burn bay then. Yeah. Uh, yeah. After, because as we say, like with uh, COVID, 
we've been we've moved more towards a triage sort of um, way to do things, and so those things are just basically cleaned. And if we can get a good digital image of them, then those are sent out to the veterans because we have such a backlog of requests. Um, and only par part of those requests are from, um, you know, those veterans who might have been hit by the fire in 73. Um, so uh, those go back in. We don't, we just try to serve them as quickly as possible. So if I'm understanding correctly, basically only those records really get treated that are required, like you're basically doing treatment in response to user requests. Yes, that's correct. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it's, it must be really nice to know that like every one of your treatments is like directly going <laughs> in response to somebody who really wants that material. It is nice and it does keep, I think, everybody more motivated and, you know, keeps us sort of on task. Whereas, you know, sometimes things linger, but um, we do get requests that are rushes, you know, um, someone needs to go into the hospital and they need a copy of their records to, to do that. And so um, those are done first in line always. But we get about, um, we look at probably, I don't know, what do you think, Cindy, about 400, between two to 400 records come into the office every day. And then we uh, filter through those and see like, which can go to just, they're not too badly damaged and they're not too, you know, infected with mold or, you know, uh, affected by mold. And then those can uh, go to like the photocopy team that's next door to us. And then the things that are in worse shape stay with us. And out of those, it just depends on how big the push is on, on the material, but we can get 20 to, 50 a day maybe or more if it's a big hit, uh, a big push. Yeah, there's really impressive. <laughs> there's a lot involved in like the triage. We've always had to do some form of triage because it's just we can't do everything. And you know, really most people don't need the physical record as much as they need the information in the record. And I think that's something that when you're dealing with disaster recovery things that's something that you have to kind of recognize and accept that your your information sometimes is good enough and is better than a few people getting a pristine record or a really nice clean record than getting 50 people the information they needed and so that we're constantly dealing with the juxtaposition of how do we safeguard the records you know for the rest of their usable life or extend their usable life and also provide the information people need for vital resources. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my next question is for Carmila. Um, you talked about kind of deciding that an object was like destroyed basically in a fire, the the one with the, um, was it like polystyrene cast balls, something? Um, and I was just wondering, how do you approach the conversation about like kind of just choosing to let an object go um, with a collector or with, you know, um, kind of the stewards of the object? Yeah, so. Um, the one with the polystyrene balls, we actually redid completely. Um, so that wasn't salvageable, but also the artist um, is a more conceptual one. And then in conversation, we basically determined what is possible. And also during COVID, there wasn't really the possibility of shipping it to him because everything was delayed and we were working with a timeline. And so we decided together that it would be best to resurface that particular sculpture in the lab um, under his kind of like guidance. But then also he gave us um, a lot of roof, room for improvement in order to, you know, use like perhaps a more appropriate adhesive and find like a technique that maybe is a little bit more efficient than what he used before. Um, and so we resurfaced the entire sculpture. Um, 
the other example was the uh, polymer balls that were placed atop um, some, some metal chairs that were fastened. And that is an installation that um, was incredibly big and was filling the entire uh, atrium of, of the house. And so I first talked to the collector about basically like his um, feelings about keeping it or discarding it uh, potentially. And since there were already a lot of like maintenance issues and the polymer matrix actually started to disintegrate already years ago, and it wasn't built very sustainably. Um, we then touched base with the artist and the artist agreed that it is actually too much maintenance that this particular object um, will require. And so um, collectively, we decided to put it to rest. Now, the artist then offered the collector to replace that particular artwork with a new one. Um, but in the end, uh, he decided to just uh, go for the payout by the insurance. So it's like different stakeholders were involved and it's like a very like sympathetic way of like making decisions where everybody kind of like has an interest, but every interest can be ideally uh, respected in one way or another and incorporated into the final decision, which is not always possible. But this one was smooth. <laughs> what do you do when it's not possible? Like, how do you approach that? Well, it's like the tug of war. <laughs> And then sometimes it's just out of uh, your control. I mean, the one thing as a conservator, how we regard ourselves oftentimes is that we're speaking on behalf of the object that cannot necessarily voice itself, right? And so um, if there is a conflict in between artist and um, collector, let's say, and then, I mean, the insurance will most likely have an opinion determining like whether something is feasible to restore or not like there's usually like a tipping point where you can sort of like make a reasonable decision but sometimes um it's so difficult that things come to a halt and even like after years of making like or trying to come to a conclusion um you're still kind of like within like the realm of like not knowing where this is going It's very strange. It's, it sounds like a really complex conversation to manage. Um, so yeah, thank you to, for speaking to that. Of course. So I'm um, thinking about like the timeliness of working with an insurance company. My question next is for Lara. Um, what was the turnaround time for the lab testing that, I mean, like it was like three rounds of lab testing right before yeah. they approved anything. It wasn't, uh, I'm, I'm gonna have to struggle to remember this because this was <laughs> years ago now and, and I feel like time's kind of warped with COVID in there. Um, but it, it, this did happen over, I mean, really from the time that the fire occurred to the time that we were really able to resolve this was about a year um, of the testing going on and such and everybody getting to a point where they were comfortable with the results. Um, now beyond that, how long, I don't know, we weren't privy to the discussion then once that came in, whatever discussion happened with the insurance company to move forward past that was, was even longer. So it, it is a slow process, um, but it was a situation where because no one felt that there was a definitive answer with the early test done by each party that everyone kind of felt like, all right, we still need to get to something that that discussion can be final. So yeah, it, it was a slow process. Mm -hmm. And so like no surface cleaning could be done right before insurance approved, but were there other areas you could work on? Um, so because they had done some um, air quality analysis and such um, really initially um, that, you know, there was a recognition that there had been some fire soil in the other areas. It was really evident. There was an immediate effort as soon as it was safe to get in and up to 10 feet, all of everything that they could touch was cleaned with rubber spray, just so that the public could come in once the air quality was safe and there'd be nothing that they could reach or touch. Um, and then there they were able to come to a decision that the masonry was getting cleaned and the windows were getting cleaned. So all of that was proceeding and they had been able to come to a resolution there, but what really was the impasse that needed the testing was the organ because it's such a complex 
element and so expensive to remove and to restore and such that the price take associated with that was, became something that they really want something definitive on. So there, there were some things that there seemed to be enough evidence that they were comfortable moving forward. But yeah, it, it became a financial question that, that before they could agree and negotiate that aspect. So yeah, there, there, was, there was process continuing. <laughs> It looks like we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, let's see. Okay, this next question is for Josiah. Uh, since we've been talking about insurance, um, like how would uh, fire fire safe landscaping affect insurance or like, you know, um, because I would assume that like, in, it's something that, it, is it something that insurance companies are aware of, for instance, like, and, and would it affect insurance for like a small museum? Um, my understanding is that insurance companies are aware of this, but it doesn't really have all that much of an effect on insurance rates. Um, sorry, I, insurance isn't my specialty, but from, at least from what I've read, it sounds like, uh, you know, fire safing your building doesn't have a whole lot of effect on your insurance rates in general. Fair enough. I would, you know, we're just curious here. <laughs> but thanks. So we've been talking a lot about, you know, working with different um, groups, you know, like collaborating with artists or the insurance companies. Um, and that can sometimes be a little daunting. And I'm just wondering, um, I wanted to ask Jared, if you have any tips for, you know, you mentioned building relationships with um, your fire, this, the fire station that's, you know, associated with, you know, your institution, but how do you, how do you make those connections? Because I mean, like insurance, like, yeah, you're, you're assigned an adjuster, but going out and meeting someone is, it might be a little daunting at first. You know, your best bet, you know, it's you want to build that relationship with your fire department. Reach out to the the local fire chief or the um, you know, the, each each department should have some type of a training officer. So you know, just reach out to them and ask who's the chief or who's the training officer, and then offer to do like a a site visit. So my department, we do site visits at various uh, institutions and businesses where you know they have some particularly complex. Uh, uh, operations that they do, or it's a particularly complex site. So the whole station will go and we'll visit these sites and all the firefighters will get to walk around through and kind of go on a tour of that site. So that way one of the employees can explain, this is this is what we're worried about here. This is the issue or the situation that we may have. So, you know, as, as historical or art institutions, we want to do that with the local fire departments. So that way they understand our storage areas. They, they understand the artifacts, the art that we're trying to protect. Um, when we go into a fire, a lot of times when we're going into the structure, you can't see more than a couple inches in front of you because of the smoke. So if they have an idea of what the layout is going into the, the area, that's, that's a lot safer for them and it makes their job a lot easier, a lot more, more efficient trying to find that fire. Um, it's just, just a lot safer then too. So I know like with our storage facility here, with all the aisles and all the, the racks and stuff like that, it turns into a real maze, especially if you can't see where you're going. So giving them that training opportunity to come into your institution and, and just see how everything works and understand some of the, the potential hazards or, or just where, you know, where the items that you want to save uh, are the first priority save. Um, helping them understand that would be tremendously valuable for them and then for the rescue efforts for your objects. Thank you. May I just ask a question directed to Jared? Um, now, one of my best friends, um, he works for a company that is called First Due. And First Due basically um, has extensive experience in providing technology solutions to public safety entities. And they basically have um, incorporated geographic information systems in order to provide maps for first responders 
of buildings that uh, include access codes, um, potential hazards, um, fire sources, explosives, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how widely is this like incorporated actually within like the, the museum or like art collection field? Um, that's pretty, pretty hit or miss throughout the country. Some departments that are very well funded can set up that technology. Um, my department's actually just starting to, to work with that. I'm using with a program called First Do, which gives you the map and then the has premise hazards and whatnot. Um, some departments, especially if you're in the more rural areas or you're an underfunded department, they won't have access to anything like that. So, um, and, and while you have those, those maps and you have some of that technology, nothing is better than being able to walk through that site and actually be able to see what it looks like when there's not when it's not filled out with smoke so you know understanding oh yeah this this building you know that has 12 foot ceilings and they have artifacts stacked all the way up to the ceiling in some aspects so you're not going to get that in the technology so those those tours that i were talking about those site visits are incredibly important and then that technology is also just another tool in our toolbox to to help us on when we're on our way to remember oh yeah that's the site that's the map, um, that's what it looks like, so it will help us, uh, but, but those tours are, are probably the more important thing. Um, this is Sonia. I just wanted to comment on the general topic being discussed. All of the institutions where I had worked, we have had our local fire uh, department team come through our storage collection storage area and we got to you know get to know each other a little bit it's um a lot of these collection storage areas are well most of them are behind the scenes and um, first responders don't really get a chance to see them or familiarize themselves with the space until an emergency happens and then it adds kind of, uh, there's an added layer of complexity because it, it is something that is so different and unfamiliar. And um, not only was it helpful to invite um, first responder firefighters into our working space, it was also really important to um, kind of sh share each other's perspective you know, first responders really focus on uh, human human safety and um, safety, you know, safety to human life. Um, and then, in terms of the material things that are saved, uh, those are not always the ones that have the most monetary value. Sometimes, the things that are most valuable to save in the collection don't really look like much. So I think that it, it's really important to identify those things within an institution's collection that are your, you know, kind of your, your most precious things that you that are most central to your mission as a cultural institution, um, and then also share uh, what those are and you know what those values are with the first responders, so you have a shared understanding of what you're trying to save and protect. Okay, I'm done. Thank you, Sonia. Um, Elena, your hand was raised for just a little bit, but I'm not sure if that was a mistake or if you had something you wanted to add. That was a mistake, I'm sorry. Oh, no problem, I just wanted to check, don't wanna. <laughs> assume anything. So I think that is kind of wrapping up all of our questions. Um, unless anyone else has any questions that they would like to share at this time. Yeah, actually, uh, Syra, one other thing came to mind um, related to your question about insurance that we're starting to see in a few places, in particularly high wildfire danger kind of areas, um, especially very remote sort of areas, that some insurance companies are just no longer offering uh, coverage against wildfires at all. So fire protection in your landscaping, your building may not necessarily make a big difference to your insurance rates, but it might make a difference as to whether you can even get insurance coverage 
Uh, that's mostly going to be an issue in very high fire danger, very remote sort of locations, but you know, it's something to consider. Definitely, definitely a, something to keep in mind, I think, especially given how frequent wildfires are becoming these days. Um, well, I think that that's a wrap. Uh, thank you to all of our speakers and attendees and a special thanks to Ruth and AIC staff for making the session possible. Enjoy the rest of your day and I hope to see you at another emergency committee event soon. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.